Mr. Johnston, Graham and Liz and Margaret and all of you, I, I thank you for um, coming tonight. I'm excited about being in your Parliament House with you, and I'm sorry I can't talk any other way. <laughs> I tried. I've been here about 10 days, and we're stuck with this. And I say strange things, and I sometimes get the meaning of what you say, but I can't repeat it verbatim. But it's been a great adventure being in Australia. You have a beautiful country, and I hope you'll come to Texas so you can understand and come back and appreciate what you have because we have nothing to compare with this beautiful country. But you didn't come to hear how I felt about your country. You came to take a walk with uh, me tonight through an abortion clinic. And I'd like for you to reflect for a moment about what you've heard about rights and choices. You know, we hear in the media that it's a woman's right to choose and that there's nothing there. And when a young woman finds herself pregnant, that's exactly what she wants to believe. And she knows there's an expert out there somewhere and she perceives that she can find it. And she opens the yellow pages and I'd like to ask you to go home tonight and open the yellow pages because you too can find it. It says licensed counselors, free counseling, free pregnancy test. And because she's heard that they're pro-choice, she perceives that she can explore all of her options. But I'd like for you to think another moment. Have you ever heard a pro-choicer talk about anything but abortion, abortion, abortion? No, my friends, they're not pro-choice, they're pro-abort. We're the pro-choice side. We're the ones who say that this is the pregnancy problem center and would you like to live with them? Would you like to live with me? Would you like to live with them? We tell her the truth about what that baby is and we actually tell her what the abortion procedure actually does. She calls that number and gets what she perceives to be an expert, but that expert is a telemarketer, skillfully trained to sell her product. But you know, if we called them a telemarketer, that girl would know what was happening, so we had to call them a counselor. Doesn't that sound good? And the young woman confides her fear, I think I'm pregnant. And the so-called counselor reassures her, we can take care of your problem. No one needs to know. Now, what's the first day of your last normal period? And the young woman gives it to the so-called counselor who puts it on a wheel that's actually designed to calculate the birth date of the baby, but she says, you're eight weeks pregnant. Now, what did she just do? She just confirmed this young woman's very worst fear. Oh, no, I am pregnant. Now, do you think this young woman says, stop, how can you tell me over the telephone I'm pregnant? No, she's talking to the expert. And in her mind, that first seed in this long marketing thread has been planted. And the next question is, is this good news or bad news? What a joke. If it were good news, she would not be calling an abortion clinic. It's bad news. And when she replies bad news, this counselor moves in. We can take care of that problem now. Really, no one needs to know. And she's looking for the fear. She needs that fear to use it to reaffirm the abortion decision any time the young woman moves away. And she starts with, your parents don't have to know. Your husband doesn't have to know. You can do it on your lunch hour. You can take half an hour, an hour extra. Whatever it is, she finds the fear and they move on because now she can resell that abortion anytime she needs to. Now the next question is, does the father know? Now why is that poor old guy hung out here as the father? The mother's not a mother and the baby's not a baby, but here he is, the father? What are they saying? What are they saying? They're saying, take your guilt, take your anger, blame him, it's his fault, not yours. And we affirmed it all the way, reaffirmed it all the way through the abortion clinic. Did the father come with you? Did the father give you money? You know what that is? That's setting it up. So she'll blame him. And that's exactly what we're seeing in America. 70% of these relationships are breaking up 90 days after the abortion, as my own marriage did. And also, my friends, it's that wedge in God-ordained relationship between man and woman. Now the next question is money. It's $270. Now calm down, don't panic now. Wait a minute, I know you're not thinking logically. Do you have a checking account? Oh, well, maybe you have a savings account. You don't? Now, wait a minute. This is what we'll do. You go to all your friends. You know, you can borrow five, ten, twenty-five dollars. You can get a part-time job and pay them all back in six months or a year. When you get your money, call me back. 
I remember so clearly the young woman who came in with a big bag of coins. Now, she could hardly hold it. She didn't have a dollar bill in there, but I didn't want to pay someone to count her money. I wanted her to count it. It would cost me an hour's worth of employees. And so I made her count it out in dollars, and she was three cents short. I would have gone to the back. I would have gotten the three cents out of my purse. I would have paid it. I wouldn't have let her walk away for three cents. But this young man that overheard it in the reception area didn't know that, and he jumped up and said, here's the money, do her abortion. My friends, the next time someone talks to you about how great abortion is, you ask them if abortions are so good for women, why aren't they free? Because this is the largest unregulated legal industry in my nation today, second only to drugs. You see, drugs are illegal. But we know they amount to $72 million a day. We can't guess what the abortion industry amounts to because it's a mostly cash business. And, you know, we kept two sets of books. One we reported, one we didn't. And we didn't report any of our deaths or major complications. Come on in and she's greeted at the door. And we let her go back because we knew it was a powerful sales tool to watch her own pregnancy test turn positive or negative. And we'd let her see this chart on the wall and say, this is a positive test and this is a negative and see your test is positive. Now you have to be very careful now. You don't want to seem too abrupt, too harsh, and so you reach out and touch her. Do you have your money? If you have your money, we can do it right now. And if you have your money, it'll all be over. And the sooner you do it, the easier it is. And the pressure is on because we knew clearly that if she went home, a friend, a family member might tell her abortion wasn't the answer and we'd never see her again. So do it now. And too many of those young women went right up to the front. We spent $250,000 a year in Yellow Page advertising. And you know it costs the same amount of money to get a non-pregnant one in as it does a pregnant one. So if she turns up with a negative pregnancy test, we tried to prove she was pregnant. How in the world do you do that? This test is not sensitive enough to pick up a very early pregnancy. You could still be pregnant and this test would be negative. And I know you don't want to worry about it. You don't want to be concerned, do you? Now, would you like to do something that would tell us for sure today? And she's ready. So we took her back for the sonogram. Of course, we checked to see what she did for a living. We didn't want to take a sonogram technician back there to read a sonogram that wasn't pregnant. So we'd get her on that table, just get a shadow on the screen, lock the screen in place, and then flip it around and say, see there, there it is. You're pregnant. This girl doesn't know a pregnant sonogram from a non-pregnant sonogram, and this is the expert saying you're pregnant and then touching her arm and saying, do you have your money? Can you do it today? Oh, I know what you're thinking. How in the world do you do an abortion on a woman that isn't pregnant? Well, in order for the abortionist to get his commission, he has to have a specimen for each one, and he has to have tissue, and so he just scrapes out more of the lining of the uterus. Now, I know some of you in here may be infertile, and if you are, please don't take this wrong. We know that we've had infertility around since Old Testament days. But have you ever thought of the new high rate of infertility we're seeing in our countries? Women who have postponed <coughs> pregnancy for their careers. You know that doesn't sell abortions, so the study hasn't been done. But if you want to know how many of those women have actually experienced abortion, ask your infertility specialist, and he'll tell you a very high number. That's another study the pro-life movement's going to have to pay for. And she's ready, but you know on a busy day, we expected um, to move our customers, and they weren't patients, they were customers, through very quickly. We knew a few things about them. Today in America, the percentage rate of repeat abortions is 45%. 45% of those women walking through the door of an abortion clinic will repeat that abortion because post-abortive women make significant decisions about their reproductive systems. They have repeat abortions, replacement babies, or sterilization procedures. We wanted them to be happy with us, that we wanted them to tell their friends how good we were. We wanted them to come back and send their friends in, and we perceived the way to keep them happy was to move them through quickly. So on a busy day, like Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, we worked two to three doctors, and each doctor had two teams of two women working with him. And team number one would set up girl number one, and the doctor would go in to do that abortion. Across the hall, team number two would set up girl number two. And when the abortionist finished abortion number one, he'd run over to do abortion number two. Team number one would take girl number one to recovery, leave her there, come back, pull the table paper down, wipe just the visible blood, 
Don't start cleaning that blood now. You'll be here all day. Just wipe the visible blood off. And then take the baby and the bottle back to the back. Now, we just let the baby go in a big glass bottle with a big, wide mouth. There were some things that you could put in there to catch the baby, but there were two problems with that. Number one, it cost 75 cents, and you've got to watch your profit margin. And then the big problem was that you had to dig the baby out, and it took so long. It was just easier to let the baby go in the bottle, put some water in the bottle, and pour it through a big, common kitchen strainer. You put that strainer under the water faucet, wash all the blood out of the body parts, dump it on an underpad, and number it for the abortionist to check. You see, in the front office, they're telling that girl, it's not a baby, it's a glob of tissue. But in the back room, as early as an abortion can be done, they're checking for arms, legs, hands, feet, the spine, and the head. Because we all know that a uterus may retain tissue, but especially in the first trimester, it will kick that tissue out. And if she passes a hand or a foot, she'll know it was a baby, and she will not come back to your clinic. So get it all. And now you wash the blood out of the bottle and you take it back, you put it in the machine, you replace the stopper. There's a hose attached, comes in a big bottle, a bag that says disposable, use one time and discard. But that thing cost $1.75 and you've got to watch that profit margin. And we reused it till the blood cocked it up. You say they don't do that, they just closed a clinic in Florida this last year for doing the same thing. Replace only the instruments used in the first abortion, bring girl number three and put her on the table. She doesn't scream, you know why? We knew how to keep her quiet because we knew if she screamed, the one next door screamed, the one across the hall screamed, it's called a screamer day. Now on a screamer day, you have to resell your patients, you have to calm your doctors down, and you even have to work with your employees, and it's going to run two or three hours longer, and you know, you pay those people by the hour. So you get into that profit margin again, so keep them quiet at all costs. We put radios in each room on different stations to cut down on cross-communication. And when that abortionist finishes abortion number two, but before we let him do abortion number three, let's talk about him. You know, physicians and doctors save lives and abortionists take lives. Don't forget a baby dies in every abortion. Have you ever looked your physician in the eye to ask him if he does abortions or refers for abortions? Well, if you haven't, go see him. Do it eyeball to eyeball. Don't do it on the telephone. You can't see him if he flinches. Now, if he says he does abortions or refers for abortions and he tells you how he's helping women, you tell him you really like him. But you don't like what he's doing. And you're going to stay in his life. You're going to talk to him very often. You're going to send him cookies, send him some of those cakes y'all make that put 10 pounds on every visitor that comes to Australia. <laughs> send him cards, but don't go to him as a patient until he stops doing abortions. And you'd be surprised, my friends. Money talks. Money talks. Why do I think that 4% of the physicians in America are willing to be called abortionist? Money. Money. You know, in America, abortion is legal from the moment of conception until the moment of birth. I did not stutter. I said birth. An abortion will cost from $250 to $8,000 as advertised in the Los Angeles Times Herald for a third trimester abortion. The abortionists will make a third of the fee in the first trimester and half or more in the second or third, but we don't want to talk about America because I live there, you don't. So let's talk about Australia. And let's not talk about the big money, let's talk about the little money the abortionists can make in Australia. You know, in Australia, the abortionist actually makes more money than he does in America. A first trimester abortion in America will pay an abortionist $75, but in Australia he makes $190. But he can do 10 to 12 an hour. Now, 10 times 190 is $1,900 an hour. 12 times 190 is $2,280 an hour. $1,900 an hour, $2,280. Oh, we all know doctors make a lot of money, right? How much can he make delivering a baby in Australia? Well, a general practitioner is paid $340, but an obstetrician gynecologist is paid $550 for a delivery. But remember, my friends, you know how you are when you're first pregnant. You rush to the doctor because you're kind of excited, even if it's not good news. You adjust to it. You, the doctor does all that lab work. Then he sees her every month, every three weeks, every two weeks, every week, and every day if she has trouble. Then she goes into labor. He's on call from half an hour to 12 hours. She finally has the baby. Now she's in the hospital for three days. He has to see her every day. She finally goes home. He can file his insurance. 
And then she comes back for her six weeks checkup. God bless her happy little heart with an hour's worth of questions. And if he only had 10 hours involved in her and he was paid that obstetrician's fee of $550, he'd make $55 an hour. But he can do abortions and make 1900 to 2280 My friends, that's what abortion is about in Australia. It's not about rights or choices. It's not about rape or incest. It's about money. But you know, this abortionist has to be careful. He can't just go in there and say, Hi, Anne, how are you today? And why are you here? Because Anne wants to tell him. She wants to tell him, and she would. And he couldn't do 10 to 12 an hour, so he has to depersonalize her, and he does that by saying, Hi, babe. Hi, dear. Some term of endearment. And he really wants to find the fear. Where does your mother think you are today? And when he finds that appropriate fear, she sinks into that table and she's very still. And should she move during that abortion? You want your mom to find out? She's very still again. He inserts that speculum which holds the vagina open so he can see to work. He quickly cleans off the cervix, the mouth of the womb with betadine, a pre-surgical scrub, and then he numbs that cervix with xylocaine, similar to Novocaine they use in your mouth when you have your teeth worked on. And then using pencil-like dilators, he quickly dilates that cervix until it's large enough to accommodate the cannula. What in the world's a cannula, you ask? Well, before 1967, an abortion was done with a hollow spoon-shaped not a wire-like instrument called a curette. And they'd scrape the baby off the wall of the uterus and then they had to remove it so they'd get the tissue force up and remove it and then scrape and remove it. It took a long time. But a New York abortionist developed the cannula. Now the cannula is six to eight inches long. The diameter depends on the size of the baby. It can be very small or very large. And it's shaped like this. You see it's curved. It's curved so it won't perforate the uterus. And these are little sharp edges designed to scrape and the suction is here. So it goes right to the top of the uterus, scrapes, the suction removes the baby, and right next to that, and the scraping and the suction removes the baby, and very quickly, that baby's life is over. And the mother's moved to recovery. And that's where we see what her post-abortive time will be like. Will she be the lucky one, the one that says, I kill my baby? Oh, I know that sounds terrible. But you see, she's admitted what she's done. She can grieve, heal, go on with her life, or will she be as I was and I believe the majority of women are? Post-aborted, a post-traumatic stress disorder similar to rape or incest, which so abuses us personally that we self-destruct for 5, 10, 15 years trying to get back at ourselves for killing our child. Drugs, alcohol, suicide attempts or completions, eating disorders. You know, there's a new report out here that says eating disorders and schizophrenia are caused by an unborn death in a family. You know, abortion is a major death experience to the mother. But the world doesn't see that. No one understands it but that woman. And then finally she comes to the same point we all do. And says, I killed my baby. I murdered my baby. And then to, she too starts that grieving, healing process. My own experience was 13 years. And when I finally admitted 13 years later that I'd kill my baby, I cried nonstop for five months. And then finally I had to tell my child's brother and sister that I'd kill a baby. And they didn't understand it. They said, why didn't you talk to us and let us help you? And I said, you were eight and 10. And my children are 26 and 28. And they're starting to mourn the death of their sister. They're starting to understand that they were deprived of that. My son is starting to understand that he was overprotected because I was afraid the police were going to pull up to my door and say, Mrs. Everett, your son has been killed for your sin of abortion. God is even with you now. My daughter is starting to understand that she was abused physically and mentally because the child I killed was a girl. And she's starting to heal. The father, oh, the father and I got together for 16 years every three to six months after our divorce 
and we'd come together and I would we'd have a couple of dates and everything would be great and then I'd remember what happened and I'd just cut his knees out from under him. And on the day our baby had been dead, 16 years, February the 16th, we cried together for the first time. And later in the year we apologized to each other and that's when I could let him go and let him go on with his life. Abortion is not against the baby and against the mother. Abortion is a crime to break down the family. It's designed to destroy the family unit of your nation and mine, and it's doing a marvelous job. That girl can't leave. She's got to stay for one more step. You see, she's got to stay for the resale of her next abortion. And you say, how in the world do you resell an abortion? Oh, it's easy. You just get her own birth control. You bring out this big silver tray. We had a huge silver tray, and we'd pull it out, and we'd say, pick a method of contraception, and she'd say, I'm never going to have sex again. And we'd laugh. You know, you got here one time, and you'll be back. Now, take these pills. Start taking them on Sunday. That way you'll never have a period on the weekend. Won't that be convenient? And she'd take them home, and she'd start hurting. She'd start hurting. She didn't want to hurt again and she wanted to be loved and she perceived that sex was the only way to be loved. She'd take those pills. They were a low dose pill that we deliberately prescribed because we knew they had a higher rate of pregnancy. We knew that girl's mother wouldn't nag her to take her pill the way she did to make up her bed and to go to school. We knew that sexual activity would go from none or once a week to five to seven times a week when she went on those pills because that's what statistics showed and my agenda, I'm sorry to report to you, was three to five abortions out of every girl between the ages of 13 and 18 and we got far too many of them. The most I ever saw a young woman have was nine abortions. My friends, the other side has an agenda. The other side knows what they're doing. You've heard it. You've heard how we have to tell our teenagers how to have safe sex, haven't you? You've heard that we need sex education in the schools. Well, look at the statistics in America, my friends. They show that everywhere they've gone in and installed their safe sex talk, that the pregnancy rate has gone right up, the birth rate has gone right down because the abortion rate has gone up. You see, birth control sells abortions, and I knew it. It's a bigger fight than we want to talk about. You say, oh, Carol, that's terrible. That's terrible. I never dreamed. But you know, what can we do? Well, I'll tell you, you're going to have to do a lot. We need more men like this. You may have to run. You may have to run for office. You may have to get involved in the hospital board. You may have to get involved in the school board. You may have to be the one that's in there finding out when the people are coming in and showing the film. They showed in my best friend's 16-year-old daughter's class, 16 years old, like Highlands High School, pornographic movie, full color, heterosexual couple having sex, homosexual couple having sex, Elderly couple having sex and a handicapped couple having sex. And when the kids protested, they laughed at them, humiliated them. They shut up. And before they left, they were required to put a condom on a banana. Yes, the parents came the next day, but my friends, those pornographic images were in those minds. And a feeding frenzy broke out. We've got to police them on every level. And you're going to say, oh, you know, I've got a job. I've got a family. I'm busy. I know you are. You are the average pro-lifer. You know, the other side's a little different. They get paid to do what they do. I used to pay my employees to make five phone calls a day to elected officials. I didn't care what name they used. I gave them the name of the bill and I wanted them to tell them they supported it. I also made them write five letters a day and they got paid to do it. We come home after we've worked all day. We take care of our families. We get them to bed. We fall in bed and we don't have time to write letters. It's time to start writing letters. Mr. Webster needs some help. And you can stand up. You say, well, what can I do? Well, let me tell you, I don't know. 
but I can tell you how to find out. It's a prayer. It's a very simple prayer. God, what would you have me do to stand up for life? You see, if we come here tonight and walk away and do nothing more, we might as well have stayed home and slept. But if we come here tonight and learn what's going on in the abortion industry and take it out of those doors and multiply, that will succeed. Oh, we're going to win anyway. God's on our side and we're the only side reproducing. But we need to do more than reproduce. You know, you can multiply in your own family. I just got my whole family converted to pro-choice. Now I'm having to convert them back to pro-life. In your workplace, you can stand up for life, wear these little feet. They'll walk up to you and say, what is that, a hang tin symbol? You say, no. Those are the feet of a baby ten weeks inside its mother's uterus. See that? Aren't they cute? You know that baby's heart started beating 18 days after conception? Did you know that baby had a brain wave at 40 to 42 days? Did you know that everything was present and nothing but growth happened after the third month? Personalize that baby. And yes, my friends, you can multiply in your church. One out of six women in the pews of American churches is post-aborted. And you know what the pastors say to me, Carol, I can't preach on that, I'll hurt them. Please hurt me so I can heal. Please hurt me so I can stand up and deal with it. We need you. We need you very badly now. Yes, we're winning the war in America, but it's a slow, hard fight. And what we have seen that one thing has succeeded in our nation. And it's that grassroots movement. And that doesn't mean you, my, me, my friend. That means you and me. You see, we're called to work together. We're called to join forces. Prayer. Graham and Liz. Out in front of that abortion clinic picketing. Helping those young women continue those pregnancies. Or maybe you'll be one of those people that will walk in the doors of the Parliament House and educate those elected officials. But it's going to take us all. I don't know how this got so heavy, but it did. I try to tell a few jokes in between, but I didn't tonight. So I am open for questions, and I really would like for you to answer any questions you'd like. Ask any questions you'd like, and I'll answer them. Answer any questions you'd like. I'd love that. Someone? Yes. Um, should any of the girls... Just die, I presume it's from hemorrhaging or blood poisoning or whatever happens after. Um, do any of the families or maybe the fathers of that child, do they come to the clinic? Do they approach anybody there at the clinic? Or it's just not spoken about? Or what happens in that case? That's a very good question. Me, Carol, could you just repeat the question? So for the, the question is, uh, what does, if a, someone dies, and I'd really like to go into several things that I didn't say, one out of 500 women either died or had major surgery, hysterectomy, colostomy, urinary tract repair, major life-changing surgery the last 18 months I was involved in the abortion industry. And part of the question was, did any of the families come back? And the truth of the matter is no. You see, there's a built-in cover-up. Think about it. They don't want to come forward and say, this is what happened to my daughter, this is what happened to my wife, this is what happened to my girlfriend. You see, they're doing everything, everything they can to deal with the situation. They want to keep it quiet, too, because you and I both know there's a social stigma attached to this. And it goes unreported. We never reported one of those deaths. We were careful. We got the woman outside the clinic before she died in our clinic, so we could always say we'd never had a death there. And we always told the girls that nothing bad had ever happened there, and that was a lie. That was an absolute lie. Someone else? Yes. Uh, yeah, Carol, uh, when you decided to uh, pull out of the abortion industry, was there any pressure put on you to go back to try to keep you quiet? When I pulled out of the abortion industry, was there any pressure to go back or to keep me quiet? There was no pressure to stay quiet because they really thought I wouldn't do anything. I had multiple offers to go back in the abortion clinic um, and much more lucrative offers than I left. 
Now, my commission was $25 for each abortion, which doesn't sound like a lot, but the last month we did 545 abortions, and 545 times $25 means my last month's income was $13,625. I would have made between 250 to 260 and 83 a million the next year because we were going to expand to five clinics so we could do 40,000 abortions so I could be a millionaire. I had a much better offer than that. But when I walked out of that clinic, we were caught doing abortions on women that weren't pregnant. Channel 4, the CBS affiliate in Dallas, sent their reporters to a doctor to be certain they weren't pregnant, wired them for sound, and sent them in our abortion clinic to see if we would attempt to abort them, even though they were not pregnant. And we did. We did. Now, we'd been killing and maiming women my children's age for 18 months. And when that happened, that was it. Yes. What made you give abortion what made me give aborting away? Well, a man came to me and told me that uh, there was someone inside that abortion clinic that God wanted out, and I thought he was crazy. But he didn't walk away from me. He told me about this man. He said, uh, you know, God loves us all, but we're sinners, and we can't save ourselves. We can't work hard enough. We can't be good enough, and God loves you, Carol. And he really wants you to come to him. And he loved you so much that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, even to die for your sins. And by this simple act of faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, your life can change. And would you like to pray that prayer? And I thought he was nutty. I thought I was a Christian. I had a Bible in my desk. I told him I prayed every day, and I did. I prayed none of those women would die. And when I, t <laughs> when I told him I tithed on all that money and he wasn't impressed, uh, I thought I was probably in trouble, but we prayed that prayer, and it was, Dear God, I am a sinner. Please forgive me of my sins. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for my sins. Please reign on the throne of my heart as Lord and Savior. Make me a worker in your vineyard. Amen. Amen. thought that was the craziest prayer I ever heard, but I prayed it, and I rushed back to the abortion clinic, and when I got back, they weren't dancing in the front door. You see, when I left, they were coming in the door saying, Isn't this great? I'm finally pregnant. And when I got back, they were coming through that very same door crying, and I'd never noticed that, and I started asking them what was wrong. Now, I knew how to sell abortions. You take the fear, you amplify it, tell them abortion will fix it, but I stopped doing it. I started saying, no, your parents won't kill you. Would you like for me to go home with you and help you tell your parents? Now, I was pretty confused. I wasn't saying, isn't this great? I saved three babies today. I was saying I lost $75. And in that confusion, I fell to my knees and from the floor of that abortion clinic prayed, Lord, if there is a Lord, if this is not where you want me, hit me over the head with a two-by-four. And that two-by-four was Channel 4 coming in and doing that expose on abortion clinics, doing abortions on women that weren't pregnant. And that was a loud and clear answer to my prayer, and I left. And I've um, had a very interesting eight years. I was an eight-year-old Christian on Saturday. I left and was a very angry, hurting woman, and the man who led me to Christ and his wife spent some part of every day with me for 18 months answering every question with Scripture. I'd say, I'm scared, and they'd say, God didn't give us a spirit of fear, but a power and love and a sound mind. And then about six months after I came out of the abortion industry, I found the 139th Psalm. And as I read how each of us is fearfully and wonderfully made, and the line that got me was that the days of our lives were ordained for us before we even were, that's when I knew I'd been involved in the murder of 35,000 babies. And I made a very conscious decision at that point. I had to decide, do I believe that Jesus Christ died for that sin, or can I carry that one? And I had to believe that he could, because I couldn't. And I found First John 1, 9, if you will confess and repent of your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive. And the part of my life now that he's still working on is the last part of that scripture is, and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And it's been awful good. <laughs> Did you have a question, sir? I think you just answered it. I was, oh. going, to, I was going to ask if you still had memories that haunted you, and if so, how do you deal with it? But I think the last answer. <laughs> you know how I deal with them. <laughs> yes. Um, I just like to ask when you go into schools to speak to children, um, you know, we certainly uh, talk a lot on uh, the development of the young man child, which I agree with you is really beautiful. But do you find it um, helpful or instructive to show 16, 17 year olds in the school how an abortion actually takes place? I don't show, the question is, do I find it helpful to show 16 and 17 year olds how to, an abortion takes place? I probably am coming from a very different point than you, but I tell them how an abortion takes place, and I talk to them about how abortions are marketed, and if I've said anything tonight you can use, please use it. But um, I try to show them how they've been sold abortions with words, 
and then I explain to them what happens in an abortion. I don't show pictures. And if you can't explain it pretty graphically, and, and then I take one of these little babies that's right up here that Graham's got out. I take that baby, and when I start talking, I pass it around. And you'll see kids that'll look at it and touch it and play with it, and then you'll see kids that'll just throw it past. And about ever, I'll watch it, and I'll say, who's got my baby? Who's holding my baby? And I personalize that that way and, and try to let them see the development of the preborn. Yes. I just want to praise God for bringing you here. Um, I believe it's real. I knew abortion was like that, but not as much. And, you know, they give a lot of um, flat to Margaret Tide, but I know that she's worked very hard in this country for the abortion, and we could not do it without it. So I want to thank you. This is my opportunity. What I want to know is that churches are very empathetic on this question. Um, I go to a Pentecostal church, and they're very loath to preach. What can we, I don't know the, the people here who will go to churches, but those of us that do, what can we do to try and get the churches to take some responsibility for this important question? And I think it's very important, and, and my pastor doesn't really want to preach about it. So what ideas could you give us to encourage the churches to take this issue a lot more stronger? Politicians are strong, you know, they have trouble, but churches need to be a lot more responsible on this issue. We do. What can our churches do to, what can we do to get our churches more involved? And I think it's very simple. You ask Graham and Liz to come in and let them do a presentation. You go to your pastor and say, I've got these people I want to come in and let them come in and do a presentation. And we can't, obviously, you've got to pray. Mm. Obviously, you've got to pray. But we've got to approach the leadership and we've got to stay in there. It's not always fun. Mm. Yeah, but the uh, first one is that uh, what do you think convicts most women that it was murder and not just uh, sort of a cleaning up type operation? Or is it different for everyone? And secondly... Wait a minute, I'm not smart enough to handle two at a time. <laughs> what convicts most women that it was murder? Women are designed by God to give life, and the minute that life's gone, we have what I call empty womb syndrome. We know we violated ourselves, and that's exactly why we attempt to self-destruct and, and self-punish ourselves. Uh, but coming to the point that we can talk about it because the world tells us there's something wrong with us if abortion hurts us because it's supposed to be such an easy choice and such a right and something that's supposed to liberate women when in fact it enslaves women. Uh, it is a long process and if you know someone that you're thinking about that may have had an abortion that you're interested in helping, all you can do is pray for her and, and love her unconditionally and be there for her when, when she's ready to heal. When, uh, after the abortion, when they go on the pill, uh -huh. they, they start uh, to become sick and more active. What do you think causes that? Is that the woman's uh, internal drive to be loved, or is that the effect of that woman? Um, what is the, why the promiscuity after the abortion? It is, is it the need to be loved, or is it because of the abortion? I believe it's because of the abortion, and we're looking for our, our self-esteem again. We're attempting to be loved. We're reaching out for something we can't find, and of course it manifests differently in every woman, but promiscuity certainly is that attempt to be loved and reaffirmed again. Oh, yes. And the question, of course, is do we see the handing out of oral contraceptives as, as the answer? And what you need to do is go to America and see that every place that we have gone in and, and preached this safe sex and handed out, handed out contraceptives, the pregnancy rate has gone right up. And I believe and will believe until the day I die that it ties right into the abortion industry because you'll see that birth rate go down and the abortion rate go right up. 
For instance, they have school-based clinics in America. I call them sex-based clinics, but they go in and they get permission to dispense to those children without parental consent. And one of the things they do the first time they talk to them in the clinic is ask them if they're sexually active and tell them that when they become sexually active, they can come to them. Well, those kids come back to them, maybe never having had sex or just starting to think about it, get those contraceptives, start taking them. The statistics show that that sexual activity will go from never or once a week to five to seven times, as I said earlier, and that's when you get the three to five abortions. And you will never convince me it doesn't tie into the abortion industry. If you go back to pre-Roe v. Wade in our nation, we didn't have that kind of problem. Of course, there was an agenda that started 20 years ago. And I think we've got to stop reacting and start understanding that. Yes, sir. that there is high statistical evidence both for the uh, effect of hormones on physical behavior and, um, and also for this that you're saying. So the government's enormous push to dispense contraception is joining the abortion industry and obviously destroying children. Oh, yeah, we can start with Christian doctors, we can start with politicians and giving them the fuel and the statistics so they can go on and, and sh know the truth. We need to dispense truth. Yes, sir. Ta If we don't return to it, we aren't going to be here. Uh, you have portrayed the American situation as an industry almost like a supermarket. Uh, looking at the Australian situation with abortion clinics, how do they differ from the American situation, given that in Australia there's a need for two other doctors to give consent? An agreement for an abortion. I portrayed the abortion industry in America as a supermarket and how do I think it differs in Australia in that there's a need for two other doctors to give consent. I think that if you look at your abortion industry in Australia it's much the same as ours and I, I ask you sir to just pick up the telephone tomorrow and make a telephone call so you can be sold an abortion over the telephone and then they work in groups of four or five so it's very easy it's almost a rubber stamp to get two or three doctors to say that any woman walking through the doors of any abortion clinic in your state or in this nation can get that without any problem and this is one of the few procedures in your nation that does not even need a referral abortions are marketed in australia just as they are in america maybe not on the same st scale because you're only doing 80 to 100 thousand would you like to add to that margaret just to give you an example, one of the big clinics in Sydney, um, some of us were participating in a rescue there last year and we had to go into the magistrate's court because we were arrested and charged with obstruction and under cross-examination, the abortionist who owned the clinic, he said that he admitted that of all the women who go to his clinic requesting an abortion, 94% of them go away with an abortion. That's production line abortion, that's all there is to it. And the few who walk away are the few who have some reservations. But certainly, they talk about counselling. We're hardly amused to learn that his so-called counsellors had been trained at preterm, Sydney's largest abortion clinic. So it is production line abortion for sure in Australia also. One more question. In that and we're going to bring Graham up. I hear what you're saying, but whether we like it or not, women are going to be up there with the choice of having an abortion or not having an abortion. You're going to have the older woman who's already got six children and uh, she finds herself pregnant. The 13-year-old who finds herself forced to be pregnant. A woman who's raped finds herself pregnant. A woman who finds herself confronted with the choice of having a mongoloid child or not having a mongoloid child. What is our society doing? What are our politicians doing in providing those people with other options? They need to have the emotional, psychological and physical support well as the spiritual support for the to enable them to make the choice. Somehow society has to look upon those women. The stigma of having a child out of wedlock, having or giving birth to a child that's born as a result of the rape, 
has to be less than the stigma of abortion. The question is, there are going to be the tough cases that we all know um, are less than, you know, 93% of abortions in our nation are for birth control. But the question is, what are we doing to provide for the, the tough cases, the hard cases? Well, it's not the government that's doing it. It's the pro-life movement that's doing it. There are problem pregnancy centers, pregnancy problem centers all over your nation who are there to help that woman walk through all of those things. Rape, abortions for rape in America are 0 .006. And we have studies now that show that the woman who has been raped um, places that baby for adoption five years later, has completely walked through it, has readjusted a life and gone on with her life, and the woman who has had that abortion is still struggling and many times self-destructive. Um, we have never been a nation, as you have never been a nation, that punishes the innocent bystander for the sin of the father. Why would we punish that baby that we clearly know is there? for the sin of that father, and why would we traumatize that mother a second time? You know, it's tough questions, but the chance is difficult that any of us are going to, you know, think about it. Do you have children? And the first time your wife got pregnant, were you excited? Well, it, it wasn't a shock, and you didn't go, ah, well, I'll tell you, I've been pregnant three times, and every time I went, ah. Now, two times, I walked through those. You know, I was 16 when I got pregnant with my son. You know, today, they would tell me to abort that child. It was tough. I'm not going to tell you it was easy, but I'm going to tell you that today he is 28 years old. He has almost two university degrees. He's a banker, and he's a pretty productive member of society. Now, he doesn't like for me to call him a product of conception, but I'm a real proud mother of that 28-year-old product of conception. And I believe that life is the answer, and those crisis pregnancy centers are here to help them, and we're not asking for government support. We're asking them for the, to come to us, and we'll take care of them. Now, they're always saying to me, are you going to take care of all the 4,000 kids that st starved last year? Yes, I am, and let me tell you why. Because I know the heart of this movement. I've seen it. You bring them to me, and I'll bring them to you, and we'll feed them all. Thank you very much. Graham Preston will be with you.